uh, towards robust skill generalization, unifying learning from demonstration and motion planning by uh, Mohammed Asif Rana, Mustafa Mukadam, uh, Reza Ahmad, Ahmad Zadeh, uh, and Sonia Trinova, and Byron Boots from Georgia Tech. Hi, everyone. I'm Asif Rana, and I'm here to present our work at, aimed at unifying learning from demonstration and motion planning. This work has been done at the Institute for Robotics and Intelligent Machines at Georgia Tech. So as robots go out of their cages and assume more collaborative roles alongside humans, we want them to have the capability to learn new skills, continuously learn new skills, but also execute them in dynamic environments. For this, for continuously learning skills, we have learning from demonstration. The aim of trajectory learning from demonstration is to generate trajectories that, does, that satisfy skill constraints that are learned from demonstration. This is usually done in a two-step process. First, a skill model is learned, which extracts all the skill constraints for multiple demonstrations. This can be either done in a dynamical system approach or a probabilistic model, or a hybrid of the two. Then, a skill reproduction module is called, which queries the skill model and adds additional constraints at the reproduction scenario to generate new trajectories, which generalize this skill. As a result, trajectory-based LFT is able to circumvent the need for hand coding skills, which otherwise might be infeasible. However, LFT has some obvious problems. First, the skill model that is learned from demonstration might not always encode all the constraints. This includes the dynamics associated with the skill, where not just the position, but also the, the direction of motion, velocities, accelerations, and their interrelations might also be, might also be important for the skill. Furthermore, the robot kinematic skills might not always be taken care of. Even more importantly, since we want these skills to be generalized in dynamic environments, we want them to take care of obstacle avoidance capabilities. Turns out this is also rather limited in a lot of LFD approaches. Some of the approaches which take care of obstacle avoidance that rather, do the, it, that rather take care of obstacles in a rather reactive fashion. For this, we have motion planning. Motion planning is one of the fundamental problems in robotics. It has been around for quite long. The, the idea in motion planning is to generate trajectories that satisfy some notion of optimality. This notion of optimality, however, is mostly simple and pre-specified. Usually, the concern there is to generate trajectories which, are, which, which, which have minimum acceleration or jerk or some other notion of optimality as the human desires. As a result, uh, since motion planning has been around for quite long, and one of the problems that motion planning does very well at is to avoid obstacles. It goes about obstacle avoidance in a very principled manner. It furthermore, furthermore, since motion planning is solving a constrained optimization problem, it allows us to naturally take into account the motion dynamics and the robot kinematic constraints. So putting these pros and cons together of LFD and motion planning, we see these, that these two have some complementary trade-offs. We, we seek to make use of the, the strengths of motion planning and feed them to LFD and mitigate the weaknesses of LFD by doing so. There are some existing approaches that seek to do this, but they rather do it in a hierarchical fashion, where the motion planning uh, algorithm is called after the LFT, LFT algorithm gives a reproduced trajectory to re-adapt it to a particular scenario. We present to you CLAMP, which is combined learning from demonstration and motion planning. CLAMP unifies LFT and motion planning in an efficient single-step optimization process. CLAMP finds trajectories which are optimal according to the learned skill, but also feasible in the reproduction scenario where we can have new obstacles in the environment and also the desired start goal states or wire points can be added. Our key insight here is that both motion planning and LFD aim to find trajectories that are optimal as well as feasible. The optimality in the case of motion planning is usually pre-specified, but in the case of LFD is, is governed by the skill at hand that is generated by human demonstrations. We further adopt the probabilistic inference view on motion planning and, and make use of it in an LFT framework. Let me go over, uh, let me give you a high-level high overview of what the probabilistic inference view on motion planning is. In this inference view, we seek to find a posterior distribution over trajectories by making use of a trajectory prior, which enforces optimality, and, a, and an event likelihood function, which enforces feasibility in the reproduction scenario. The trajectory prior in continuous time is essentially a Gaussian process, which by the definition of a Gaussian process can be represented by a bunch of support states. Now, the, 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 uh, the likelihood of events happening in the reproduction scenario, which can be desired start or goal states, or arbitrarily placed obstacles, we can take care of that in the event likelihood function. We condition this prior to get a posterior. 
The post here, as you may, no as you may notice, satisfies the constraints of the scale that are encoded in the prior, which is highly constrained in the middle part of the trajectories. The, it turns out the desired optimal and feasible trajectory is the maximizer's posterior. Now I'll go over each of the parts separately. This is a summary of clamp where, as you can see, the demonstrations provide the prior, which enforces fe uh, optimality, and the likelihood function takes care of the reproduction scenario, which enforces feasibility in the reproduction scenario. The map inference procedure eventually gives us a desired optimal and feasible trajectory. Now let me delve deeper into the prior learning part and how we go about this prior. So the prior we have here, a human provides multiple demonstrations for a given skill. In this case, I'm showing a box opening skill where demonstrations start from different initial positions. They reach a box, which is shown there, and this, all of the, these demonstrations slide it sideways to open this particular box. As you can see, the, all the, the motions are highly constrained towards the end in both positions and velocities. We record the end effect of positions, and velocities are estimated, estimated using splining and differentiating. We further uh, time align all these trajectories using dynamic time warping algorithm uh, in order to time align all these trajectories. So here's uh, one of the position dimensions of the trajectories I'm showing here. As you can notice, once the contact occurs with the object be being manipulated, the, the positions become highly constrained. This is also true for the velocity part of the trajectories, although I'm not showing it here. We want our prior eventually to encode all these constraints. So we assume in our, in our prior formulation that the trajectories are governed by underlying stochastic scale dynamics. Here, in our implementation, we went about uh, going with the discrete time formulation, but we can also choose uh, a continuous time form formulation if required. In this scale dynamics model, the next state is related to the previous state via a state transition mat matrix, plus an additive Gaussian no noise term. The states, uh, the states are further uh, composed of the positions and the velocities concatenated in a vector form. So let's, let's me, let me show you with this toy example how we go about learning this prior. The f we, we start with the Gaussian over our initial states, which take care of all the trajectories. Now the next state is related to the previous state, as I mentioned before, by the, by the, by the straight transition matrix, which we can learn by use of linear ridge regression. The additive Gaussian noise term, term can be viewed as the uncertainty in our estimate. We repeat this step for the next time interval, and we keep on repeating this until we reach the end of our trajectories. In the end, we end up getting the, the prior, which is a Gaussian over time, with a particular mean and a covariance function. As you, as you can notice, the covariance evolving over time, the initially we have a higher variance because we have more, uh, less restriction on our trajectories, both in positions and velocities. Again, the, veloci uh, the velocity part is not being shown here. Towards the end, it gets more restricted and the variance become lesser. However, this, this, was, this was all learned in the work workspace. Eventually, since we have a robot, we want motor commands for a robot. It turns out for a high degree of freedom robot, this problem is under constraint, since we can have, we can have multiple solutions for a given workspace trajectory. Uh, simply put, we can, we can enforce another optimality criteria in the configuration space by making use of another prior that we impose in the configuration space. Since the workspace trajectories are not independent of the configuration space trajectories, they're rather mapped using the kinematics of the forward kinematics of the robot, we, we simply reparameterize the workspace prior according to, kin to the kinematics. The, the mean and the covariance remain the same, however. The, the combined prior that we eventually use that enforces optimality both in the workspace and enforces optimality in the configuration space is the product of these two. Here, when I was mentioning the configuration space prior, we can also choose to learn this from demonstrations, or we can, we can choose to pre-specify this to enforce smooth trajectories in the configuration space. This is the combined prior that we eventually use in our map inference procedure. Now that I've talked about the prior, let me go over to the likelihood uh, part, which takes care of the reproduction scenario. Let me take a break here and get some water. Okay, so now that I've talked about the prior formulation, let me show you how we take care of the, of the, of the reproduction scenario where we can have, have new obstacles or desired start or goal states. This is taken care of by the likelihood function. So say we, at the reproduction scenario, we want to start from a given start state. The start state uh, likelihood function is a Gaussian at the desired start state with the mean at this state 
and a very small variance since we are certain about this desired start state. The same can happen for a desired goal state or a wire point. We condition this prior on this to get a posterior which takes care of these desired start and goal states. Note that this is not just happening in the, in the workspace, but also the configuration space joint trajectories can also be specified the same manner. Now to take care of new obstacles that are placed in the reproduction scenario, we can, it turns out we can also make use of a collision-free likelihood function to take care of them. This is parameterized by the sign distance of the object, of the, of the obstacle, and all the robot links that are, that are present for that robot. Again, imposing this collision-free likelihood gives us a prior which takes care of both these, both, the, all, both these start and goal constraints and the obstacle avoidance constraints. And if we may have other constraints as the reproduction scenario may desire. So now that I have talked about the prior which takes care of the demonstrations uh, governed by the skill, and I've talked about the likelihood which takes care of the reproduction scenario, let me go over to the map inference procedure which gives us our desired trajectory. It turns out that the, that the desired trajectory is the maxima of this posterior as I discussed before. However, for, for large trajectories, doing uh, inference can be computationally expensive because of the inversion of a very large covariance matrix. We go about this in a very clever manner. So our trajectories that were, that, uh, the prior that we learned from demonstrations had an underlying stochastic skill dynamics. Due to this, our prior has an exactly sparse inverse covariance matrix. We make use of this structure in our prior for fast inference on a factor graph. So let me go over uh, what factor graphs are. Factor graphs have been around for quite, quite a while, and they have been used by SLAM community to, and they, have, they are quite used to using large factor graphs to carry out optimization. <coughs> Any probability distribution can be represented as a product of functions organized as a bipartite factor graph. Here, as you can see, this is, this is a, uh, an example factor graph where a sparse precision matrix leads to a highly factorized distribution and a sparse factor graph. So let's go back to our prior and try to post this on a factor graph. It turns out, due to the sparsity in our, in our inverse covariance matrix, the associated factor graph, where I'm showing here the configuration space states related to the trajectory that we want to reproduce, they are in distant states are connected via these configuration space prior factors and the workspace prior factors, and there are no other connections. So you can see this, this, this prior, uh, prior factor graph is quite sparse. Now to incorporate the reproduction scenario where we have new obstacles or desired start or goal states, turns out we can pose this on the factor graph as additional factors. The final factor graph you see is quite sparse still. We make use of, uh, we convert this factor graph to a least squares optimization problem and again borrow ideas from the SLAM community to solve this in a very efficient manner by keep making use of sparse linear algebra solvers. This, this is being carried out in a very efficient manner. So we implemented the skill on a few object manipulation scenarios. First, as I showed before, some of the demonstrations for a box opening skill, the associated prior learned is being shown here. So as you can see in, uh, in the graphs, in the, in, the first, in the first graph I'm showing the 3D plot of the prior with the associated trajectories. As you can see, the variance is higher initially in the positions, and it starts to decrease as we go along the trajectories, which shows the, the motion is highly constrained. It's not only constrained in the position part, as I mentioned before, it's also constrained in the position, in the velocity part of the, of the prior, because the direction of motion is highly important as the box is opened by doing a sideways motion always. Here I'm showing some of the reproductions. On the left, I'm showing the reproduction from different initial states of the robot starting and going to the box without an obstacle. As you can see, all these uh, reproduced trajectories are, are able to satisfy the scale constraints towards the end, which is highly constrained, and are able to open the box. Now I'll show how these trajectories go around an, an arbitrarily placed obstacle, still satisfying the skill constraints, and are able to open the box. We executed this on a real robot too. On the top row you see uh, trajectories starting from different initial positions, going to the box, and uh, on the bottom row you see the same starting from the same initial positions with an arbitrarily placed obstacle in the environment. So as you can again see, all the trajectories are able to, to open the box successfully. I, we also implemented this, uh, this algorithm clamp on a drawer opening skill. Here the human is providing one of the demonstrations and we provide eight demonstrations for this particular skill. In the previous case, we provided six demonstrations, so the number of demonstrations is quite low. 
the human opens the, opens the drawer by pulling it towards itself. Here I'm showing some of the reproductions. On the left, you see reproduction without an obstacle. And on the right, you see reproduction with an obstacle. All these trajectories that are being, re being reproduced are able to do the final sliding motion, which is highly important for this skill again. Again, taking care of both the position constraints and the velocity constraints. In short, we have presented CLAMP, which is combined learning from demonstration and motion planning. CLAMP is an efficient and unifying framework which combines the strengths of motion planning and learning from demonstration. CLAMP enables skill generalization over new obstacles in the environment and the desired start, goal states, and wire points. Furthermore, CLAMP enables accounting for the skill dynamics, which are critical for articulated object manipulation tasks, which I showed in my experimental results. It also takes care of spatio-temporal variations in the demonstrations, and also the kinematic constraints of the robot in one efficient unifying framework. Uh, as a result, CLAMP is not only able to uh, en enable robots to learn new skills, but also generalize them in dynamic environments. Thank you. All right, we have a lot of time for questions. Please uh, step up to the microphone if you'd like to ask a question. Thanks, this was nice. Uh, I have had a bunch of questions, but I, uh, one is so you require the, uh, the, the object in, in question to always be in the exact same position, right? Yeah. Okay, and the other question I had was that when you have these obstacles, uh, they always have to be like elliptical, modeled as elliptical blobs or no? So first, on the clarification on the first part, yeah. the object does not have to be in the same location. So if, if the, the human who is providing the, the demonstrations wants the object to move as well in the reproduction scenario, we, we would want to move the object there. Or you can assign reference frames to it. Uh, I, can you repeat the second question again? Yeah, w when you place obstacles in the scene that you uh -huh. have to get around, right. do you model them as like Gaussian elliptical blobs in the space as well, or can they have arbitrary shapes? Yeah, so if we first generate a sign distance field around the obstacles, and then it's, uh, it's, it's then we further, yeah, it's, it's a Gaussian around those. So, and there, there's, a, there's a tuning parameter that's, that I showed in the, in the likelihood function, that sigma obstacle that governs how much, how much uh, distance we want from the obstacle. How much it pushes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I like how you decoupled the problem into this optimality and f feasibility. Mm -hmm. um, so re one question regarding if your demonstrations themselves are encoding some sort of obstacle avoidance behavior, have you looked into whether you can learn the likelihood or whether you can learn like how to put, like whether uh, to follow a particular obstacle avoidance strategy or? Yeah, this is exactly some of the work that we are doing currently. Okay. That uh, this can be viewed as like what we are doing, learn, uh, we are learning the, prior, learning the prior here, right? And getting a posterior. Instead, we can yeah. go about learning a posterior and also learn these parameters of the likelihood function. Right, thanks. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question was, how do you think um, this has advantages over um, having a trajectory given by LFT methods and using motion planners after, like in a hierarchical or sequential mm -hmm. manner, like you said? So as I explained before, so what's happening here is that all the constraints which are governed by the skill and the reproduction scenario, they're all posed in one, one factor graph eventually, and it's, it's all optimized in, in, one, in one single step. Uh, some of the approaches that I mentioned, so some of the approaches you'd rather do is that they use an LFD approach, and they get a trajectory out of it, and then they eventually call a motion planner to add kinematic constraints or obstacle avoidance capabilities. This adds redundancies and inefficiencies in the, in the framework. And the eventual trajectory might as well be suboptimal. All right, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time.